Okay, so welcome to 341. And so what I want to do today is I want to first talk a little bit about the Pythagorean formula. And the reason is to just go over, you know, how we do proofs, how we think about how you attack something. And then I want to talk about, you know, some of the more famous distributions, the gamma distribution, the and different consequences of them. And again, whenever we need to do a calculation, oh, it's not, it's not just fine, right? Whenever we need to do a calculation, what we always want to do is we want to integrate without integrating. You know, integrating is hard, it is difficult, and in fact, you cannot do it in general. So we have to do a tremendous amount of work to find a function where we can get a nice close form expression. And so what we will do today is we will continue to look at ways to just identify the functional form and once we know the functional form, then deduce what the answer is. All right, so just very quickly, everybody should know the Pythagorean theorem. If you do not, just nod and go, you know, you move your hand like, oh, yeah, of course. All right, the only real freedoms you have in stating it is which side is A and B, and which way do you have the hypotenuse slant? Okay, no one ever had to move down. That would be just wrong. You can do either left or right. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared for a right triangle. How do you prove this? So this is one of the oldest proofs that we still teach. You know, copyright has long expired. You know, here is you know, one of the standard ones going back to Euclid. We're just drawing a lot of lines. If you find this hard to read, you know, is it a little bit easier if I put it in color? Well, maybe because now I have some sense. Okay, well, probably this gold area is probably equal to that gold area, and this gives you a clue of how you might go ahead and prove things. If you really want a challenge, try to make sense of this proof. I'm guessing that grade two is equal to grade two over here, and so on and so on. But when you see this, the natural question is, and they decided to chop it up this way, how? You know, there's a lot of times in math where you can understand a proof line by line, but if you had to create something of, on your own, no idea how to start. And that's why I want to spend some time just going through the thought process of how do we come up with stuff like this? All right, so this is the first proof that I really remember. I learned this in question physics. Take the square of side A plus B. Uh, with a little bit of work, you can show that you, know, you have four right angles, obviously, with this big square. And where the two Cs meet, there's always going to be a right angle as well. We're just playing some angle games. And then the inner square has area C squared. The triangle has area one half base times height, because it's just a rectangle. And so you would get A plus B squared is equal to four one half AB to four triangles plus C squared. And when you cancel, you get A squared plus B squared. So that's one proof. Um, here is another way of doing the proof is by just moving things around you know, with my four triangles and rearranging them. I see I'm left with you know, squares of sides A and B. And this is another way of saying A squared equals B squared. I'm sorry, C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Garfield is often famous outside of Williams as being president of the United States of America, but those of us in the math department know that he should be honored for being credited with a proof of the Pythagorean theorem. You may argue that his proof looks highly derivative of uh, something we've seen earlier, but don't. So he does get credit with a trapezoidal proof of Pythagoras. All right, so there's lots of different proofs. And the question is, how do you find these different combinations? And at the end of the day, do you actually have a sense of why is it true? Or is it just a long brute force calculation that you've done? We have so many long brute force calculations that we're doing this semester. This is why I really want to emphasize how do we look at things and get a sense of what the answer is. All right. So I'm going to go a little bit fast because we have a lot of brute force calculations to do today. Here are five candidates for the Pythagorean theorem. Can somebody give me a reason why one of these is bullshit? That there's no way it can be true. Yes. Yeah, B is bigger than A, it's bad. Even if A is larger than B, then unfortunately this means that C is going to uh, three is right up. What else? What else is bad? Yes. Fifth one looks bad. So if you think about it, if I have a base of side A plus B, and then I expand out A and B, they'll never hit. 
So the hypotenuse has to be greater than a plus b. So if you look at a plus b squared, you would get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So any number greater than 2 can't work here. 4 is still possible. 5 is actually Good. Unit analysis. The top one is meters cubed is equals meters squared. But what about the second one? Right, but we should be. Right, but you in the 45 45 90 triangle A equals B. Yeah, if you change your definition of A, it's not symmetric in A and B, which makes me a little suspicious. I would expect the formula would be symmetric. So when you do simple tests like this, the only one that survives is the form. Turns out it's false, but something of that form can work. All right, so here's my favorite proof of Pythagoras. So we take a right triangle, ABC. So the area is clearly going to be a function of C and the angle X. If you want, you think of B as C cosine X, A as C sine X. And so the area is proportional to C squared. The proportionality constant depends on the angle. If I triple C, I'm going to triple B, I'm going to triple A, so the area goes up by factor of nine. So we know the area is some function of angle times C squared. We need to draw an auxiliary line. You know, almost every good geometry proof involves drawing an auxiliary line at some point. Any thoughts on what line we should draw? Okay, where, where, the altitude, some other one. so where do I start? So if we bisect the angle X, then it's going to come in here at a strange angle. It will give us another right triangle down here. So it's not a terrible choice. And what angle do I hit C at? Yeah, so the, the best is to come up to see at two right angles. So it is the altitude to that side. So this is not a terrible choice coming up here because it does at least give you another right triangle. And it gives you two angles out of the same. So it's a good thing to try. It turns out this is better because the triangles turn out to be similar. If this is X, this is 90, this is 90 minus X, so this is X. So the triangles are similar. They all have the angle X. And so now when I look at this, I just get that the area of triangle one is F of X times A squared. Triangle two is f of x times b squared, and the area of the big one, which is the sum of the two areas, is f of x times c squared. Why does that imply a squared plus b squared equals c squared? Can we divide off by f of x? I'm sorry, you used a bad word. No. So when you assume you make an ass out of you and me. You cannot assume. You have to justify. How do you justify? Well, if f of x is zero, then the area is zero. And so you know, we don't have to assume, but we, we do have to justify. So the argument is that f of x is non-zero, therefore we can divide by it. I'm going to do this extremely rapidly for those of you who enjoy physics. If I have a pendulum swinging, I have a gravitational force down, I have a mass m, I have a length of the bob, I have x, which is the initial angle, which is unitless. And if you look at all the quantities I have, if I want to calculate the period, how long it takes the pendulum to go back and forth, the period is in seconds. The only way I can get seconds from all these quantities is I've got to have a square root of L over G. There's nothing that can cancel the mass. So the mass can't come into play. So before I even go into the lab, I know that the period should be proportional to the square root of L over G with a proportionality constant depending on X. It turns out the proportionality constant is independent of X and it's related to two pi. There's no way you can get that. But just by doing a dimensional analysis like this, you know, before we even do any experiment, we can see if we quadruple the length, the period doubles. If you have the power of Q from Star Trek The Next Generation and can change the gravitational constant of the universe, you, know, you can also see changes like that. But for us mere mortals, we really can't change G. L we can work with. All right, so this was just a really fast introduction to how to think about proofs. 
Now I want to shift to some of the inputs we're going to need in the distribution. The first is the gamma function. And we've actually seen it already when we did the wide distribution earlier. So gamma of s is defined as the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x, x to the s minus one dx, or I could write it as x to the s dx over x, just moving the negative one over. The reason to do this is related to some advanced mathematics. If I change variables and replace x with say five times x, dx over x is invariant, it doesn't change. And so there's some advanced theory of looking in the background why that's a little bit better. Without that comment, you should be going, why the hell would you define it as s minus one? And so there is a reason why we're doing this. So whenever you see an object, the first thing you should always ask is, does it exist? So when I'm integrating this, uh, you know, for the most part, we will look at just s as a real number greater than zero, but it actually could be a complex number. So when we look at this integral, there's two possibilities for this integral to cause problems. We have an e to the negative x. So e to the negative x is great decay at infinity. And x to the s minus one is only polynomial growth. So even though we're integrating over an unbounded region, I'm actually not worried about the integral converging as I go off to infinity because e to the negative x decays so rapidly that the x to the s minus one can't beat it. Now, near zero, near zero, e to the minus x is approximately what? Approximately one. So looks like you know, the integral from say zero to epsilon x to the s minus one dx, which is going to be x to the s over s at zero and epsilon. And that's going to be okay if the real part of s is greater than zero. So as long as s is a positive number, this is going to be finite. If I took S to be negative a half, you know, say S equals negative one half, we would get X to the negative one half over negative one half at zero and epsilon, and that blows up. So this is why we have the condition, you know, real part of S is greater than zero. And as long as that's true, this is going to converge. Can anybody think of a value of S where it might be easy to calculate this? What value of S is screaming at you? Please use one, right? So gamma of one is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x, and that just equals one. Building on this beautiful success, what do we try next? Two. So Gamma of two is the integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative x times x dx. How would you evaluate this? What substitution? U substitution. So we could do, uh, how would you do with U substitution? It's something else, not U substitution. Integrate by parts. And so, Integrate by parts and you get one. There is another way to get one though. You can recall that this is what? There's a nice interpretation of this in a probability class. What if I write it like x into the negative x dx? Does that remind you of anything? Yeah. It's the exponential distribution, right? What quantity uh, is this attached to the exponential distribution? Oh. It's the mean, right? This is the mean of an exponential distribution with lambda equals one. So it just equals one. Ah, gamma of one equals one, gamma of two equals one. It must always equal one. Do you believe this conjecture? That for every value of s integer, this is always going to be one. Yeah. 
Ah, uh, you have you have been paying attention. All right, let's calculate dm of three. So we have e to the negative x x squared dx. How would we evaluate this? By plus. And just in the interest of time, I will do the calculation and I will get two. Oh, one, one, two, it's the Fibonacci number. That's why they're having me teach probability because I'm actually on the board of the Fibonacci number. It actually is an international board. Awesome. Yes, one of my contributions was to increase the number of members on the board to 13, which is a Fibonacci number. We actually took a real human as opposed to just making Fibonacci, you know, numerical number. So do you believe that it's the Fibonacci numbers, one, one, two? All right, you want more data? Gamma of four is six. Anybody want to guess the next one? Factorial. So we should really view this um, one is really zero factorial, one factorial, two factorial, three factorial. So again, so much of math is how do you look at things? All right. So unfortunately, the gamma function is a shifted factorial. I'm sorry? That's, that's the S minus one. And so you can actually prove by integrating by parts that gamma of S plus one is S gamma of S. So this is proved by integrating by parts. So you know, gamma of S plus one is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x, x to the s minus one plus one. Oh, I'm sorry, I guess um, s plus one minus one dx. And so you would let u equal x to the s, dv equal e to the negative x dx, du is s, x to the s minus one, v is negative e to the negative x, and then this would just be uv at zero infinity minus the integral from zero to infinity of v du. But when I look at uv at zero and infinity, when I put in infinity, it's clearly going to be zero. And when I put in zero, I'm going to have uv, well, x to the zero is going to just be, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, zero to the s is just going to be zero. So the uv term vanishes. So it's just going to be the negatives reinforce and we'll have the integral from zero to infinity of v du. So it's e to the negative x, s, x to the s minus one dx, which is just s m of s. And so in particular, gamma of n plus one will be n factorial. And you can just prove that by induction. So this function generalizes the factorial function. It's defined not just at the integers. If you wanted to figure out what is pi factorial, we now have a way to interpret. Okay, so right now, this is one of the few times when we're using techniques of integration. You know, for the most part, fortunately, use substitution and integration by parts is almost always all we need to do. Okay, so as remarked, you know, gamma of n plus one is n factorial. This comes just from integrating by parts. It's an extension of the factorial function. So I'm not going to prove these. These are in the book. The first is the cosecant identity. Gamma of s times gamma of 1 minus s is pi cosecant pi s or pi over sine pi s. In particular, the best choice of s is 1 half. Because if you take 1 half, you get gamma of 1 half, gamma of 1 minus a half. Oh, that's just gamma of one half squared. And so you get gamma of one half is the square root of pi. If you want, you can view this as negative one half factorial, because remember gamma of s is like s minus one factorial. So in some sense, if you ever need to take negative one half factorial, if you wanna know how many ways are there to rearrange, you know, negative one half of a person when order matters, the answer is the square root of pi. And we will see later today that this actually arises in the normalization of the Gaussian. So this is a very important value. 
How many of you have seen the beta distribution in a stats class? Okay, so at least two people have seen the beta distribution. So the beta distribution is defined as t to the a minus one, one minus t to the b minus one. And it turns out that when you integrate this, you know, if you play some games, you get it's gamma of a, gamma b, gamma a plus b. There's a lot of ways to prove this. But again, if you think about it, as long as a and b are greater than zero, this integral is going to be well behaved. Because my integrand is never going to be too bad. You know, if a was zero, I would have a one over t. The integral of one over t blows up. You know, the integral of one over t is going to be like log of t. And when I evaluate log of t at zero, I get negative infinity. But as long as a is greater than zero, I have t to a power that's a little bit greater than negative one. So when I integrate it, it'll be t to the a, and then everything will be well defined. So this integrand is nice. So there has to be some normalization constant. It's wonderful that we have an explicit closed form expression for the normalization constant in terms of a and b. And then the last is, you know, we can just use that to define a probability density, the beta distribution. And it's just going to be, you know, t to the a minus one, one minus t to the b minus one. And then I just take the reciprocal of above, and now it integrates to one. And this turns out to be a nice flexible family. So on the next page, I just plotted a few different choices of beta. And not surprisingly, they start at zero and they end at zero when you have the extremes. And they basically go up and go down in slightly different ways. And depending on your choices, you can get a lot of different shapes. Yes. You can make it very close to a normal distribution, yes. Uh, I believe by taking, for instance, I would, I, I'll, I'll be careful um, as to just how close can we take it to be to be normal and, and what the mean would be. Let me get back to you on that. I, I believe that there should be a choice that should make it look a lot like that. What you really want to do is you want to say, well, what happens if I add two beta distributions? Because if I keep adding a bunch of beta distributions, by the central limit theorem, that should convert. I don't know right now if beta plus beta is still beta. If you then be, be scaled. All right, so I want to just quickly talk about the normal distribution and the gamma function. And so the 2mth moment of the standard normal is just x to the 2m times the density of the normal, 1 over root 2 pi, integral e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. And we've seen a couple of times that this is just 2m minus 1 double factorial. I claim that it's also 2 to the m over square root of pi times gamma of m plus 1 half. That you can actually calculate the moments. What do you think the easiest choice of m would be to compute? So we want m to be an integer. So I'm, I'm going to throw out the, the half. So the half is not bad. There's something easier than one, though. Zero, right? So let's build intuition. So build intuition. Take m equals zero. So now we're going to study mu zero is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of one over square root of two pi e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. We've seen this before. What is this integral? Now, how did we find that it was the normal? What did we do? Yeah, we generalized it. We multiplied it by itself, and we bumped it up to a two-variable uh, multidimensional problem. Let's play some games. Now, I'm going to write, I'm going to double the integral. I'm going to integrate from 0 to infinity and just double, OK? So this is going to be the same as 2 over the square root of 2 over pi integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. And I'm going to let u equal x squared over 2. The reason is I have some suspicion that this is related to the gamma function. The gamma function is defined with an e to the negative, say, x. So I don't want to have an x squared over 2. I want to just have an e to the negative x. So let's let u equal x squared. And that means du is going to be x dx. So that means dx is x inverse du. But I can't write x inverse. I have to just write something in terms of u. Well, if u equals x squared over 2, then that means x equals 2u to the 1 half. 
right? So we would get dx is going to be 2u to the negative one half du. And for the Seinfeld reference, top of the muffin, 2u. We now put these pieces together. Two divided by square root of two pi. I could write that as the square root of two over pi. Um, I'm gonna keep it like this because right now I'm not sure if the algebra is better to simplify or not. So let me just keep it as is. This was X goes from zero to infinity. Now U is gonna go from zero to infinity. I get E to the minus U and then DX becomes two U to the minus one half. So it's two to the negative one half, U to the negative one half, du. Okay. Well, let's see, two times two to the negative one half is just square root of two divided by square root of two. So all the twos cancel. So I have a one over square root of pi. And then I have the integral u goes from zero to infinity, e to the negative u. I have u to the negative a half. I'm going to write u to the negative one half as u to the one half minus one du. How would I write it as one half minus one? Here is the definition of the gamma function, right? So, so much of life is about algebra. I'm trying to make it look like the gamma function. The gamma function, I wanted e to the minus u. And now I want you know, my variable u to the s minus one. So I don't want it to the negative one half. I want it to something minus one. So I'll write negative one half as uh, one half minus one. So this over here is just going to be what? The gamma function at one half. And this is one over square root of pi. So if you can calculate gamma of one half without knowing that the integral of the standard normal is one, then you would actually have another way of determining the normalization constant of the standard normal. The question is, how do we compute gamma of one half is equal to, you know, if we can prove the cosecant identity without using the fact that the standard normal has integral one, then we're in business. And then that would be enough. You know, we would just not have the one over square root of two pi. We would just keep it as an arbitrary constant that we don't know and we would now get. So this shows you a relationship between mu zero and the gamma function. So to, to now you generalize. So we would have an x to the two m incorporated. What is x to the 2m in terms of u? So x to the 2m is going to be 2u to the m. So it's going to be 2 to the m, u to the m. Oh, well, when I look at what happens, that's why I get this extra factor of 2 to the m outside, this extra factor of m. So now it will yield mu 2m is 2 to the m over square root of pi gamma of m plus 1. So the proof is really not that much worse if you have a 2m moment instead of just the 0 moment. It's nice to do the 0 moment first, build intuition. OK, a lot of material. Any questions? OK. So next is you know, the gamma and the Weibull distribution. I'm not going to really say too much about this right now because we talked about this in the baseball uh, lecture. It's just showing you here's more places where the gamma function arises. It's a nice normalization constant. And again, uh, very useful. What I want to spend the rest of time today on is the chi-squared distribution. I'm not sure if we'll get to everything today. So a chi-squared distribution with parameter nu greater than or equal to zero degrees of freedom is defined as follows. Its density is zero if you're negative, and for positive x, it's one over two of new halves, gamma new halves, x to the new halves minus one, e to the negative x halves. 
So as long as nu is greater than or equal to zero, if you look at the exponent of x, um, well, let's see, if nu is actually equal to zero, I have some problems. So let's say nu is greater than one. We'll force ourselves to have at least one degree of freedom. If you take nu equals zero, it actually doesn't converge. So we'll take greater than equal. So it's clear that this is going to integrate. And if you look at what we have, the x of nu halves minus one, e to the negative x halves, when we integrate that, that's almost a, 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 a gamma function. The only reason it's not a gamma function is you remember, oh, I've got the, if I cover that up over there, I can just write it over here. So it almost looks like the gamma function when I integrate this. The reason it's not quite the gamma function is an e to the negative x, I have an e to the negative x over two. So if I want to integrate x to the new halves minus one e to the negative x over two dx from zero to infinity, I let x over two equal u, so dx equals two du. And then you can see the gamma function emerge. And so when you do the algebra, after algebra, you get the claimed normalization constant. But the main idea is you know, when you look at this, you should see, yeah, it really looks a lot like a gamma function when I integrate. The only difference is I have an e to the negative x halves, and I want to have an e to the negative x. So I just have to change variables to get rid of that one half factor. Not a big deal. All right, so we now have a chi squared distribution. Right. Here's plots of you know, several different choices of chi squared distributions. You know, as you can see, as nu gets larger, it's moving outward. And it does turn out that as nu goes to infinity, it converges to a Gaussian. And you know, the mean is going to be growing and the standard deviation is going to be growing. All right. So this is a lot of beautiful relationships with chi squared random variables and normal random variables. So if you take a normal random variable, mean zero variance one, our favorite normal, and you square it, it turns out that that is a chi squared distribution with one degree of freedom. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go back and just take a snapshot of this so we can keep um, on our sites what the chi-squared distribution is. Okay, so let's try to figure out what is the probability distribution of the square of a standard room. So this is the CDF technique. So let's let y equal x squared, where x is a normal with mean zero and variance one. So what is the probability that y is less than equal to y? This is the probability that x squared is less than equal to y. And clearly we need you know, y to be greater than equal to zero. So if I want x squared to be less than equal to y, what does that tell us about the x? Where does x live? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Nope. Where does x live? x squared has to be less than equal to y. So where does x live? Between between this between plus and minus the square root of negative y. So we get this is the same as the probability negative root y less equal to x, less equal to square root of y, right? Right? So x squared can't be negative, but x can be negative. Well, this is just going to be the cumulative distribution function of x at the square root of y minus the cumulative distribution function of x at negative square root of y. At this point, you should be petrified if you have to actually evaluate this because we don't have a nice closed form expression for the cumulative distribution function of the standard normal. This is why the CDF method is so great because the CDF method never forces you to actually evaluate it. You always take the derivative. This is equal to the cumulative distribution function of y 
And so to find the density of y, we just take the derivative. And so now we take the derivative by the chain rule. It's going to be, I'll just do it slowly, the derivative of this at square root of y. And then we need the derivative of square root of y minus you know, the derivative at square root of y and then the derivative of negative square root of y. So this is just the density of x at the square root of y. And then the derivative of square root of y is going to be one half y to the negative half. So the other one, the negative sign is going to reinforce. And you will get plus uh, at negative square root of y, one half y to the minus one half. But because the density of the standard normal is symmetric, if I evaluated square root of y or y, um, uh, square root of y or negative square root of y, it's the same thing. So this is going to just be twice the first, so the one halves cancel. It'll just be fx square root of y times y to the minus one half. Well, it's one over square root of two pi e to the negative input squared over two. Input is square root, is square root of y, so I get y over two y to the minus one half. Because fx is symmetric. Use fx is even because it's the density of the standard normal. And so because it's the density of the standard normal, these align. And now I just plug in, you know, I'm using fx of x is one over square root of two pi e to the negative x squared over two, and I'm just evaluating. And I can write y to the negative one half, I can write this as one over uh, two to the one half gamma one half. And then upstairs, I'll just do y to the one half minus one e to the negative y halves. And so I'm just rewriting this algebra. You know, the square root of two is just two to the one half. Square root of pi is just gamma of one half. Y to the negative one half is y to the one half minus one. E to the negative y half stays the same. And notice that that's exactly my density. So this shows that we do have a chi squared random variable with one degree of freedom. So the square of a standard normal is a chi squared with one degree of freedom. Any questions on this? So again, it's worth you, this is all done in the book, it's worth going through these slowly, but you can do these calculations the CDF method is very powerful. You can calculate the mean and the variance of you know, chi squared random variable. I'm not gonna go through that calculation in the interest of time, but I strongly urge you to make sure that you can do a calculation like that. Right, here's an absolutely beautiful thing. If you have a bunch of chi squared random variables, and you take the square of them and you sum them. Well, if each one of them is a normal with mean zero and variance one. Okay, so each xi is, is, a, is a standard normal mean zero variance one. If we sum the squares, it's a sum of chi squared random variables. Each one has one degree of freedom. The theorem is that their sum is going to be a chi squared random variable with k degrees of freedom. More generally, if you just have a sum of chi squared random variables with degrees nu one through nu m, then the sum is a chi squared random variable with degrees nu one plus dot to dot plus nu m. And it turns out to prove this, we only have to do it in the special case when we have a sum of two chi squared random variables. If we can show the sum of two chi squared random variables with parameters nu one and nu two is a chi squared with parameter nu one and nu two, we're done by parentheses. So if we have y1 plus y2, I'll say plus y3, plus y4, then what we do is we just go by induction. When we sum those two, this is going to become a chi-squared 
with new one plus new two degrees of freedom. This is a chi-squared with new three degrees of freedom. So by just using the sum, then the sum of these would be chi-squared with new one plus new two plus new three degrees of freedom. And so on and so on and so on. Yes. Yeah, I mean, really what's going on is it, it really is an induction. And so induction is the nice formal way to write it, but it's essentially, it's a proof by grouping parentheses. So it's all about grouping parentheses. And so we only have to prove this theorem in the special case when we have two chi-squared random variables that are independent. We don't have to do the general case. We get the general case essentially for free. All right. Looking at all of this stuff, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, is the change of variable theorem. You should have seen this in multivariable calculus. And I will leave it at that. All right. So what we want to do is we want to do the special case of the sum of two chi-squared random variables. You know, the general case would be... Uh, You know, f nu one composed with all the way up to f nu n. So here we actually just have um, two random variables. So I actually don't need all the dots in between. And the reason is the density of the sum is the convolution of the densities. So this is our big starting point. Whenever we want to find a density of a sum, we always go to convolution. And so now let's look at the integral that we need to do. So here. Again, is our friend the definition of a chi-squared random variable. I really don't want to keep writing the density constant, so I'm going to just call it c sub nu. And so for the first one, I get c nu one, and then I'm evaluating the density at t. So I have t of the new one over two minus one e to the negative t halves, and then I have c nu two. Uh, and now, because I have y minus, I have y minus t to the new two over two minus one e to the negative y minus t over two. All right, who's looking forward to doing this integral? All right, who would like to find a way to do this integral without integrating? Yes, okay. So the first thing to notice is we have an e to the negative t halves, we have an e to the negative y, and we have an e to the positive t halves. All the exponentials cancel, except for the e to the y, e to the negative y, but e to the negative y doesn't depend on t. I can pull that outside the integral. So it's going to be c nu 1, c nu 2, e to the negative y. And then I will have the integral from 0 to y of t to the new 1 over 2 minus 1, y minus t to the new 2 over 2 minus 1 dt. Does this look like anything we've seen before? Sorry? Oh, yes, negative y over 2. Does this integral look like anything we've seen before? Not quite geometric. It looks like the beta. Yeah. Right. What was the beta? The beta was t and 1 minus t. We have t and y minus t. But remember, you know, that foreshadowing we had at the very beginning of this lecture where we talked about dimensional analysis and units, we're integrating from 0 to y. I can rescale things and things are fine. So I could replace t with new variables. Let's let t equal y times u. So dt is going to be u dy. And the reason is if I do this, I will get y minus y times u. I can pull out the y. If I have t as you know, y times u, I can you know, pull out the y. And now what's nice is my bound of integration will be independent of y. So this is a natural change to do. You know, let's have y and t essentially look the same. If y equaled 1, it would be just our beta distribution. And so as y varies, I want to just understand how things depend on y. I'm trying to just glean the y dependence. I don't care about anything else. So since I only care about the y dependence, 
I want to pull the y outside the integral. I want to remove y from integration and the bounds. So if I do this, I get c nu 1, c nu 2, e to the negative y halves. And now, instead of going t goes from 0 to y, we now have y goes from 0. And how high does u go up to? Oh, sorry, this is not y, this is u. So if t equals u times y, when t equals y, what is u equal? Equals 1. Oh, yes. Um, sorry, it should be yes. It should be uh, y du. Now, t becomes y u to the new 1 over 2 minus 1. Y minus T becomes Y minus Y U to the new 2 over 2 minus 1 Y D U. So C new 1, C new 2, E to the negative Y halves. I can pull out everything. I'll get a Y to the new 1 over 2 minus 1 from the first, plus a new 2 over 2 minus 1 from the second, plus 1 from the Y outside the Y D U. And I'll have an integral u goes from 0 to 1 of u to the new 1 over 2 minus 1, 1 minus u to the new 2 over 2 minus 1 du. Do people recognize this as a beta distribution? Yeah, I don't give a shit. It's just something. Right? It has no y dependence. Independent of y. It's just some number. So now we have the normalization constants going to be, say, c, c nu 1, c nu 2, e to the negative y halves, y to the nu 1 plus nu 2 over 2 minus 1. Must be chi squared with parameters nu 1 plus nu 2. And there is integrating without. We just detected what the functional form was. Did this in a page. We don't need to know that this is equal to a ratio of a product of a gamma function with another gamma function. This is the power of the method. If you can identify how your probability distribution depends on the, on the variable, the normalization constant must be whatever it has to be to make it integrate to one, to make it being the probability distribution. We're done. So there's not time today to do the sum of squares. So I will save that for um, another lecture. But there is a beautiful way to calculate uh, the sum of squares of standard normals. And you can actually use this to calculate the formula for the volume of the n-dimensional ball, as well as the surface area of the n-dimensional ball. We still have you know, 20 seconds, people. How many of you remember your spherical change of coordinates? multiple calculus. Okay, for those of you who don't remember them, don't worry because you're going to have to learn spherical coordinates in n-dimensional space. Or again, we can integrate without integrating and find a way to bypass all of that. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. All right. So we'll do that. Majority rules. All right. Have a great day, all.